So now that we've set up um, the social planner problem, we've looked at the um, objective function of the social planner and we've understood how public expenditure, uh, how it affects welfare, the different channels through which it affects welfare. So now we're in a good position to actually determine the optimal um, public expenditure in our generic, you know, divine um, beverage Sam Wilson framework. Uh, so let, let's do that now. So uh, optimal Uh, public expenditure, it, what it does is that it maximizes um, welfare, which is U of C, where C is um, private um, employment, private productive employment, but that's actually a function of G, which is public productive employment and um, G. Um, and, you know, and we've talked about the properties of um, this objective function. So here we're going to assume uh, just to be able to solve this problem, we, we'll assume that the function which take uh, which take G as an argument and associate social welfare, so U of C and G G. Uh, is well behaved. So when I say this function is well behaved, what I mean is that uh, it admits uh, a unique extremum and uh, this extremum is it's an interior uh, maximum. So that's what I mean. So, you know, your function has only like one peak and, you know, and, and that peak is interior and, you know, it's a max, it's a maximum. Now, um, so for instance, you know, a function that would work well for that would be uh, if you had a strictly uh, concave function uh, with, you know, an interior uh, with an interior extremum, then that would work uh, perfectly. Of course, if the function is strictly concave and uh, and the extremum is on the boundary, then uh, you know, then, then you then you don't have an interior solution. But something that's strictly concave with an interior extremum would work. Um, so we have a unique extremum, it's an interior maximum. So we just make this assumption such that uh, under this assumption, then we know that uh, first order condition, this assumption, we know that the first order condition is necessary and sufficient uh, to find The solution of um, the planner's problem. Uh, so that's why I make, you know, that's why we make this assumption so that we can just take a first order condition. Uh, you know, so that's just really our standard approach, you know, in macro. Uh, Okay, so we make this assumption. We know that we can take a first order condition. So that's what uh, we do now. We're trying to solve the planner problem by first order condition. So the first order condition um, just tells us that the, uh, the derivative, the total derivative of welfare with respect to um, public expenditure is equal to zero. Um, and this total derivative of welfare with respect to G, we already computed it in a previous lecture. So the partial derivative of uh, the utility function with respect to um, public expenditure, public employment, uh, minus partial derivative of the utility function with respect to private um, employment, plus 
So this is a direct uh, crowding out effect plus the partial derivative of the utility with respect to private employment. And now we're looking at the effect of public employment on private employment, you know, through uh, the stabilization aspects or through how uh, through the response of unemployment. Uh, and so we have a minus u prime g. So this is all derived in your previous uh, lecture. So minus u prime g. And then we have a minus 1 minus minus v prime of u. So here I put a minus minus v prime of u because we know that the beverage curve is not worth sloping. So minus v prime of u is, uh, so v prime of u is negative, minus v prime of u is positive. So I like to deal with positive number. Um, so that's why here I put a minus in front of the u prime so to have something positive. And here I put a minus in front of v prime with another minus to have something positive. And so this, of course, has to be equal to zero. Uh, so this is what we had seen when we looked at the different um, channels through which um, public expenditure affects welfare. So now let's reshuffle this term. So if we put um, so DUDC on one side, we get that um, DUDC. has to be equal um, to du dg plus du dc times minus u prime of g times 1 minus minus v prime of u. All right. So this is, you know, we're just rewriting the first order condition. So now what I can do is let's derive everything by du dc on both sides. So here, you know, I'll have a one. Here I have du dc that's going to disappear. Um, and here you notice I'll have du dg that's going to be divided by du dc. And that's just going to give us here one side divided by du dc. This is just going to give us um, the marginal rate of substitution between um, public and um, private consumption. Because as we defined uh, earlier, the marginal rate of substitution is just uh, du dg, dg divided by du dc. So if I rewrite everything, I'll get that uh, 1 is equal to the marginal rate of substitution between g and c. Uh, you know, that comes from this term here. Plus, so this is disappeared, I have a, I have a 1, I have plus minus u prime g, 1 minus minus v prime u. Okay. So now we have some simplification, and it allows me to bring the marginal rate of substitution between g and c in the equation. Now there's another thing I can bring in the equation that you notice here I have minus u prime g, so that's just minus du dg. It's a change in the uh, the increase, the decrease in unemployment when uh, I increase um, public employment, but that's just uh, that's just by definition that's just the unemployment multiplier. So I can have the unemployment multiplier in the formula too. So I'm just like bringing in all the sufficient statistics that I've defined earlier. So one has to be equal to the marginal rate of substitution between public and private and goods plus the unemployment multiplier times one minus minus v prime so minus v prime of u is the slope of the beverage curve. So it's really this is just uh, one minus the uh, one minus the slope uh, one minus the slope of the beverage curve. Okay. Uh, so this is our first formula for optimal um, public expenditure. So this is characterizing optimal public expenditure here. Um, this is really a key result. Now, so of course, here, you know, this is not really telling you all oh, public expenditure should be X, you know, like X percent of the labor force should be employed by um, the government. So we're not there yet. We don't have an explicit expression for um, public consumption or um, public expenditure, public employment. Um, you know, all these things are isomorphic here. Um, but this is implicitly describing uh, the optimal um, public expenditure. And now we'll have a bit of work to try to make it more explicit. Um, but before we do that, I want to highlight the two big blocks in this optimality condition and talk a little bit about them. Um, so first, you can see. Um, 
So we have a first block here which says one is equal to uh, the marginal rate of substitution between public and private consumption. This block actually, this is just the Samuelson, the famous Samuelson formula. Uh, the Samuelson rule. So the Samuelson rule you know, was derived in a neoclassical model. Um, and in a neoclassical model, um, the, form, the Samuelson rule just says that the marginal rate of substitution between public and private consumption has to be equal to one. Or if you want, it just said that the marginal utility of private consumption has to be equalized to marginal utility of um, public consumption. So that's what the Samuelson rule says uh, in a setup like ours. And you know that's obvious. Like think about you know, think about a neoclassical world in which um, your output in the economy is fixed, and you have to split your output between public goods and private goods, and the sum of the output has to be equal to um, you know, the capacity in the economy. Well, yeah, then sure, you know, if you take one unit, you know, if you take one good and you move it from public good to private good, um, you know, the cost is that you know, if you add one public good, if the total capacity in the economy is fixed, you reduce one private good. So how many private goods are you going to take away and divert towards public goods, well, you're going to do it until the marginal utilities of private goods and public goods are equalized. Um, you know, that's, that's what maximizes welfare. Um, if the marginal utility of um, public good is more than the marginal utility of public good, well, then you will keep on taking, uh, you know, private goods away and, and transforming them into public goods because they have a higher marginal utility, so you can increase welfare. If the marginal utilities of public goods has become more than the marginal utility uh, has become less than the marginal utility of private goods, and you reduce um, spending on public goods until the two things are equalized and you've maximized welfare. So that's just what the Samuelson rule says. And here you can see that we see that Samuelson rule appear here, that the marginal rate of substitution has to be equal to one, or one has to be equal to the marginal rate of substitution, but there's an extra term that you can see here. And this extra term, uh, this extra term that we have, so that shows up here, oops, That extra terms appear here because we are not anymore in a neoclassical model. Uh, like um, like Samuelson, now we're in a model in which that's in general um, inefficient. And so, you know, here we always have some slack, and there is one special case when slack is efficient, but in general, slack is not efficient. And because of this inefficiencies, we have an extra term, a correction term that appears to the Samuelson formula, and we have to correct it to take into account the fact that there is some slack. And when you change public spending, you are able to affect the amount of slack in the economy. And these are welfare consequences. You know, if you have too much slack and you're able to reduce slack, well, then this is good. So public spending is more valuable than uh, what Samuelson thought. If you have too little slack and you increase public spending, this will reduce slack further, but it's going to be bad. It's going to have an extra cost, an extra welfare cost, so that public spending is less valuable than what Samuelson thought in his neoclassical model. So the fact that there is slack that's generally inefficient and that public spending affects slack, it's going to add an extra welfare effect and therefore an extra term in the optimality condition. That's what this second term is here. Uh, so the term m times 1 minus minus v prime of u, which can be interpreted as m times 1 minus uh, the, beverage, the slope of the beverage curve. So 1 minus the beverage um, slope, you know, normalized to be positive. Uh, this is uh, a correction term um, that appears in a model, in a framework with um, inefficient slack. In, you know, or in, if you want, in a model uh, with productive inefficiencies. And um, so right now it's not totally obvious why this is related um, to slack and inefficiency, but now what we're going to do is, you know, one, we're going to work a little bit on the Samuelson rule part to make, to make it clearer 
to make the you know the departure from the Samuelson rule um, clearer and to bring into the formula um, the amount of public spending. But then we're going to work also on the second term here, the correction term. Uh, to so we have the Samuelson rule and we have this um, correction term that appears with uh, you know it's like a stabilization term to make it clearer that it's a term that arises because of the inefficiencies in Slack. So we're going to do a bit of work on that. Um, so we could call this, uh, this is a stabilization term. It appears because the economy uh, is not, uh, because the economy is not stabilized at, you know, uh, efficient unemployment. And we'll see why exactly in a second. So it's a stabilization term. So we're going to work on both terms at once and then that will give us a formula that still implicitly defines um, the optimal public expenditure, but in a way in which um, you know that's much more telling. And so we'll introduce like uh, extra kind of statistics, but it will be much easier to interpret that formula once we rework it. So let's we'll, we'll do that, we'll rework both terms um, separately. Um, but the optimality condition for public spending is this formula, and we're going to work on it now to learn more from it. Uh, 